much, Daniel. Um, yeah, we, we thought we used the opportunity because it's the start um, of the new year to um, just reiterate a bit what the idea of this um, seminar series was. I'm Connie Guell. I'm an associate professor at the University of Exeter. Um, I lead a project together with Tessa Pollard, who's here on the call as well, um, as part of the School of Public Health Research, the Healthy Places, Healthy Planet stream uh, on costs and evaluating um, coastal communities um, and policies that should enable healthy and sustainable travel for them. Um, and we're using systems thinking and systems methods and approaches in that um, project and quite a few of um, the um, researchers on the project are relatively new to systems thinking. Uh, everyone is really excited about it, um, but we were wondering how everyone can be on the same page um, and learn about systems approaches. We also know that lots of people are really interested in, in the approach and this way of thinking, but don't know where to start. Um, so we thought it's a great opportunity with the help of SPHR. So big thanks to them to uh, set up a seminar series um, and just hear from people who um, uh, our systems thinkers are using these approaches, have found their own way um, towards this method and, and help us um, um, start um, using these approaches and see how they could be useful for us. Um, so huge thanks to Daniel, who was really um, instrumental in organizing the, the series for us and SPHR and Amy for the tech. Um, and a huge thanks today to Miriam um, for giving a talk today. Our paths first crossed over 10 years ago now, I think, at the University of the West Indies in Barbados. She's selling in from there today, uh, very much as to qualitative researchers. Um, and we found our way to systems thinking through different projects, but actually also ended up working uh, on a project using systems approaches together. Um, so anyway, big thanks to everyone also for joining in. I think um, it's been um, a, a great series so far with um, lots of people. I think we said from Barbados to Bangladesh, we had um, so far participants um, dialing in um, and finding the series really useful. I'm handing back to Daniel to introduce Miriam properly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Connie. Uh, so uh, let's get straight into it. We're delighted to have Dr. Miriam Alvarado. Um, she is a welcome Trust Postdoctoral Fellow at the Centre for Diet and Activity Research at the MRC unit at the University of Cambridge, uh, and a visiting fellow at the George Lyon uh, Chronic Disease Research Centre at the University of West Indies in Cave Hill, Barbados. Uh, Miriam is interested in integrating multiple types of evidence in policy evaluations, taking a systems thinking approach and developing co complexity informed methods to synthesize policy evidence from diverse settings. Her work focuses on preventing non-communicable diseases through population level policies, such as sugar sweetened beverage taxation. She led the evaluation of Barbados sugar sweetened beverage tax and has worked on expert consultations with the PAHO and the UN. So I'll pass over to Mariam for the remainder of the session. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to watch the first series in the seminar and a real pleasure to get to participate in this way today. I will be discussing using causal loop diagrams for hypothesis building and evidence synthesis. And just to give you an overview of the presentation today, I'll start with just a little bit of background around system thinking, and then I'll move on to focusing on how causal loop diagrams can be used uh, in system thinking informed evaluation in particular. Um, I'll go through sort of what brought me to these methods, and then I'll conclude by uh, going through two applied examples and trying to bring the proposed process to life a little bit. Um, then we'll conclude with some time for a Q&A. So please um, note your questions or comments along the way. I would love to hear from you um, at the end. So let's get started. What is systems thinking? Uh, we've heard a few definitions in this series already, um, but just briefly, I quite like this definition here by David Peters. At its core, systems thinking is an enterprise aimed at seeing how things are connected to each other within some notion of a whole entity. Um, he goes on to suggest that it might be quite useful to dive into some of the theories, tools, and methods that encompass systems thinking to get a better sense of what it really entails. So I'll follow that guidance and share just a few such methods today. Um, the first, causal loop diagrams, or CLDs. Many of you may be familiar with them. 
Um, these are represented through standardized notation and can be used to convey causal relationships, um, polarity, delays, and direction of feedback loops. So the feedback loop component of CLDs is really important, and there can be two different types of feedback loops, um, reinforcing feedback loops, um, which tend to amplify an effect, or balancing feedback loops, which on their own tend to lead to oscillation and stabilization around a particular value or level. And then, of course, these feedback loops can be joined up and interact with one another in often surprising or perhaps counterintuitive ways. One thing I wanted to emphasize here is that although they can end up looking quite similar to other types of systems maps, causal loop diagrams are distinct in that they use this um, standardized notation. Um, and they really do emphasize this um, aspect of feedback loops. So I'll come on to this again later in the presentation. A second systems thinking tool are systems archetypes. Um, now systems archetypes re refer to common patterns that have been observed to occur in many different types of systems. And they've been sort of cataloged and summarized. These tend to be combinations of a small number of feedback loops. So between two and five, um, and they tend to show up in all kinds of systems. So they can be a useful starting point um, for identifying underlying system structure. Finally, um, the last method I'll touch on here is system dynamics modeling. So this is a computer-based simulation approach that again emphasizes feedback loops and now introduces stocks and flows and accumulation over time, um, which enables things like delays and kind of surprising patterns over time to be reflected. Um, these can be used across a range of different types of systems and are quite closely rel related to causal loop diagrams. Um, again, I'll come on to this in more detail and provide just the beginning of an example at the end of the presentation. Okay, so turning to the evaluation sort of purpose of today's talk, how can CLDs be developed? Um, this is no way meant to be exhaustive, but uh, at least an indicative uh, menu of options. So there's uh, CLDs that can be based on primary data. Um, many of these include CLDs based on using a group model building process, which involves conversations and eliciting information from a group of stakeholders. This can be either done in person around a whiteboard or chalkboard or online. We've heard an example of that in the presentation last time. Uh, these can also be developed using one-on-one -on -one interviews as another form of primary data collection, or they can be developed based on secondary data collection, so using a review of literature or a review of project documents or a combination thereof. And then how can CLDs be used? Again, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and there are many other possible applications, but I thought I would just highlight a few here today. So first, CLDs. Uh, can and within public health typically have been used to identify potential leverage points and interventions. In other words, to work perhaps with a group of stakeholders to brainstorm and ideate a group of interventions that might not have been obvious um, at the outset. Second, they can be used in this process of developing systems-informed research questions, perhaps at the outset of an evaluation. Um, they historically actually were initially uh, used to communicate the structure of a system dynamics model. So today we typically maybe develop a CLD and then in some projects use that to inform the development of a computer simulation system dynamics model. That order was actually flipped historically where simulation models were developed first and CLDs were often used to simplify and communicate and convey key messages about the simulation structure. Um, so I just wanted to draw your attention to that as well. But today I'm really going to be focusing on uh, developing research questions. What brought me to these methods? Uh, my PhD focused on evaluating a sugar sweetened beverage tax here in Barbados. And when we started off uh, with this evaluation, we used kind of the implicit theory of change that was dominant at the time, which as you can see, was quite a linear theory of change. Um, and it was quite helpful in terms of focusing and directing the way that the evaluation was designed. But afterwards, we looked back and wondered, could we have better anticipated and evaluated unexpected consequences and feedback loops if we had started this off 
from a systems perspective? And what would that have looked like? What would it entail? So it's kind of this question that has led me uh, to the material that you'll see today. We've heard about this in past presentations as well. The most recent um, update to the framework on development and evaluation of complex interventions in which the authors highlight and I think delineate between these four research perspectives. I found this quite a useful way to identify that in the past, the initial evaluation I summarized really took an effectiveness and theory-based approach. Um, and here we're looking at what a systems approach might add or contribute um, in addition to these other lenses on evaluation. So to dig into this work, um, a group of co-authors and I tried to think through what it would look like to apply that framework to evaluations of sugar-sweetened beverage taxes in particular. So again, you can see these same four research perspectives. Um, this paper is available through BMJ Global Health. Um, and we tried to look through the literature and identify examples of evaluations that had adopted each of these perspectives. And then also consider what the value added of taking a systems perspective in this context might be. In the thinking behind this paper, we came to uh, consider that it might be useful to delineate the process that we use to develop a research question from the methods that we use to evaluate that question. Um, and so I'll show you what I mean here, but we thought it might be useful to distinguish between a traditional quote unquote approach to developing an evaluative research question, typically in population health interventions that entails some combination of an effectiveness and theory-based lens in comparison to a systems lens. But then regardless of how the question is developed, we again can have this choice of either using a quote unquote traditional method by which I mean natural experimental evaluation methods such as interrupted time series, difference in difference, et cetera, or perhaps a systems method. Um, and I'll come on to this and what this might look like again a little bit later. So there might be different combinations that we can imagine. For example, this one shown in bold corresponds to what we did initially in the Barbados SSB tax evaluation. We asked an effectiveness question and we used an uh, interrupted time series method. But now we wanted to explore what might happen with a systems question, either traditionally answered or using method, systems methods. I'll focus on a proposed process that we can use to, to develop questions from a systems thinking perspective. And you'll see that we've summarized these five steps. Um, this is work actually that Connie and I did along with other colleagues, some of whom are on the call at the European Center for Environment and Human Health. Um, so we kind of summarized these five step uh, process that could be used at the outset of an evaluation to develop a systems informed research question represent the underlying system, represent the policy or intervention, identify the linkages between the two, use this to develop research questions, and then on the basis of that, design the evaluation. Um, so I'll go through each of these steps in the two applied examples. The first is considering street trees as an intervention. Um, so you've probably heard various um, cities calling and committing for uh, you know, a certain amount of trees to be planted and a certain amount of years. Street trees and street tree planting policies have the potential to reduce the urban heat island effect, to increase walkability, to have a positive impact on mental health outcomes. And in fact, that was the connection that our team was tasked with exploring further, the relationship between street trees as a nature-based solution and mental health outcomes as a human and health well-being outcome. So in this particular project, we used a review of literature to develop the CLD. And our purpose in doing so was to develop this systems informed research question. So I'll go through the process. We were quite lucky, I think, in this instance in that we were able to identify a causal loop diagram around the system of mental health or around mental health. Now, um, this was actually based on a review that had been published and the review authors themselves actually synthesized the evidence they found on determinants and impacts of mental health using a causal loop diagram framework. For our purposes, we abstracted and simplified the framework they had. They went into some uh, quite biologically focused pathways and we didn't necessarily need that level of detail. So we simplified their model into what I've uh, summarized here on the screen. 
Um, then we started to consider street trees as the intervention and some of the factors around street trees. So both the number of trees, but also the tree canopy size, um, resources for trees and tree health. And then here in step three of the process, this is I think one of the most important steps, we tried to identify linkages between the policy intervention and the underlying system around mental health. So to do this, we, like I said, used a review of the literature. Uh, we identified several, several reviews focused on street trees and from them identified both impacts and determinants uh, related to street trees. Um, we also conducted some targeted searches to try and see whether there were linkages that weren't covered in the reviews that might still be important in building out this map. Um, this is the sort of cleaned up summarized version, but I wanted to sort of draw the curtain back and bring you in a little bit under the hood. So this next slide shows the full detailed model. And you can see a few things about this. Um, first, you can still see the sort of core underlying mental health model here in the center. And then factors related to tree canopy and number of trees or street tree stock. Um, so each one of these nodes and connections was um, evidenced by literature that we identified. Um, but you can also see that this is quite large and a bit unwieldy um, for us to work with as researchers trying to interpret it and make sense of it. And certainly from a sort of storytelling and engagement perspective. We used Kumu to sort of work around this. It's a free online software. I would recommend uh, looking into if you're interested in working with kind of large scale or detailed CLDs because of some of the interactive functionality and what that enables you to do. So within Kumu, we were able to zoom in and zoom out um, at different levels of the map. So you can focus on particular nodes or links or even feedback loops. And you can also build interactive presentations, which we found to be quite a useful way of um, sort of telling the story of the CLD with our stakeholder group. I should say throughout this project, we had um, stakeholders in three different municipalities um, who were sort of reviewing and inputting and feedbacking to this process. And we also had several street tree experts who um, also reviewed the evidence in detail and provided additional guidance. Just to get into the nuts and bolts even further, um, this is an example of what the Excel sheet that we've uploaded into Kumu looks like. And so you can see the, the nodes here and the type of connection. Um, but you can also, I think, importantly see that as much as possible, we tried to capture excerpts that um, evidenced or underpinned each of the connections in that map, as well as the references and type of literature from which they came through. And I think this was an important um, component to both make it clear where we had made assumptions and to kind of encourage a high level of transparency in, in the modeling process. Okay, step four. This is where we get into actually analyzing the CLD and developing the evaluative research question. So I had mentioned systems archetypes at the outset. Um, we used some of the thinking around systems archetypes at this stage. So we did two different things. Um, first, we abstracted from that detailed CLD to kind of the most high level summary that still captured some of the important dynamics. And um, that's what's summarized in this figure. So you can see we've really simplified the mental health system into this one reinforcing loop. Um, incidentally, most of the loops in the underlying mental health system were comprised of reinforcing feedback loops. And that was one of the key findings from the Wittenborn review that we drew from. So that structure of the feedback loop is still maintained here, even though we've simplified it right down to one big reinforcing loop. We also have this reinforcing loop around tree health and then the interconnections between the two. And this might seem quite simple, but the hypothesis that we drew from this is that for street trees to impact mental health, the health of the trees themselves is critical. And this might seem kind of clear now, looking back, but at the time it wasn't necessarily something that was front of mind within our research team. Um, so it was helpful to pull this out, you know, when we're talking about sort of um, maximizing the mental health impact of this intervention actually, Perhaps it is the tree health that needs to be um, put to the forefront. And actually, when we spoke to um, street tree experts, they confirmed this and said, yes, this is the insight that is kind of well known amongst specialists. 
but that they struggle to communicate to other municipal stakeholders and people beyond their expert group. And they gave us the feedback that being able to show even this simple kind of math was a helpful way to convey that message and to make the links more clear. Um, we also found evidence in some of the literature that we reviewed of what happens when this is not the case. So for example, there was an instance of a street tree planting project, I believe in Baltimore, where trees were planted, but there was zero maintenance um, allocated or earmarked for the newly planted trees. And they were planted in a lower socioeconomic neighborhood. But what happened over time was that the trees um, decayed and died and started to be diseased. And residents actually said that the eroding tree health had a negative impact on their sense of pride, their sense of place, and their, their sense of being kind of forgotten um, by the rest of the city. So it was quite an evocative example of how when this feedback loop works in a negative direction, it really can have uh, ripple effects, even in terms of uh, impacting the people in that community. The second way that we uh, worked on this uh, stage four within the process was by explicitly going to the system's archetypes and exploring whether there were any that could be a useful lens to turn uh, on this topic. So we looked at, again, the success to the successful archetype. Um, so in this archetype, there are two reinforcing loops that are connected. And the idea is that there might be two actors sort of competing in the same space and even a very marginal, like slight advantage at the beginning of this uh, process can give one of the actors an advantage that accumulates over time, while the slight disadvantage can have an increasing, decreasing effect. Um, there are increasing decline for the second actor. So that's kind of the snapshot archetype. And we thought that it was a useful thinking tool when it came to understanding some of the processes that might lead to inequities in street tree distribution over time. So in neighborhoods where there were a plethora of street trees, um, particularly mature trees and larger tree canopies and well-maintained trees, residents were more able to, to benefit from these trees, both in terms of home uh, value, as well as walkability, the mental health benefits, the greenery, et cetera. And so they would experience the value of those trees and perhaps advocate for them at a higher level. On the flip side, we found evidence actually of the reverse happening. So in places where um, tree, tree distribution was lower, but also tree canopy size was smaller, um, people reported not really perceiving many benefits from the trees and in fact, perceiving some disbenefits with people perhaps vandalizing trees or trees being seen as a bit of a waste of money because they didn't confer any value um, within the neighborhood. This then had a knock-on effect where in places where tree vandalism was high, cities were less likely to invest in trees and more likely to plant small or spindly trees, which were less expensive, and more likely to just reinforce that sort of negative experience of the tree within the neighborhood. When we presented this to one of our uh, stakeholder groups in Denmark, their reaction was actually, wow, this is sort of opened up a new perspective for us on some of the work that we do. So they explained that at the moment, they were using a participatory system to allocate uh, new street trees within the city. And this had been seen as a really good thing. Um, citizens were able to vote on where they thought new trees should be planted. And this was perceived as having the benefit of encouraging citizen engagement in the process. But after reviewing this success to the successful archetype, the stakeholder mentioned it might be possible that an unexpected consequence of this system is that we might be encouraging a process that leads to greater street tree inequity. And so this seems like a great opportunity to uh, consider or propose an evaluation that could actually empirically evaluate this using geocoded street tree data and looking at historic voting records. This evaluation is just at this phase. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we will be able to go forward with it, but I wanted to illustrate um, the ways in which this led us to a completely different question than we would have started off with at the beginning of the street tree work. So here you can really see how the systems thinking process and developing the CLD from the literature led us to a different question around this inequity process and the success to the successful hypothesis. But that question could easily be evaluated using um, available data and traditional methods. 
we, if you're interested in following up on more of the details of this, um, the paper is available. And we summarize a few other hypotheses that we sort of took from the abstracted CLDs. Excuse me, one moment. Okay, turning to the next example. Um, this focuses on sugar sweetened beverages, um, once again. But we used a different process. And so I should say this work is ongoing with colleagues um, through the University of the West Indies here in Barbados. Um, so it's a little bit of a sneak peek. Some of the results are still in flux and may change. Um, so please bear that in mind. So for this uh, project, we used a group model building process with stakeholders. And it kind of embedded this within a larger community-based system dynamics project. Um, I didn't prepare slides on community-based system dynamics, but I'm happy to come on to it in the Q&A um, if anyone wants to pick, on, pick up on that. And again, our purpose in developing the CLD was to develop an evaluative research question. This is a snapshot of our stakeholder group. So we had about 20 stakeholders um, for a back-to-back two-day introductory session. Um, you know, within this room, we have people from government, from civil society organizations, from education, academia, industry, um, and the media. So really a lot of different perspectives on the same issue. Uh, to focus the discussion, we started off with this graph. Um, within systems thinking, this type of graph is often referred to as a reference mode, um, which means a graph over time of a key variable, which can be used to sort of focus the discussion or to help make decisions around the boundary of the system. So this reference mode or graph over time was focused on sugar sweetened beverage consumption um, per person per day from 1990 on to 2018. And you can see the levels for um, children and adults in Barbados in comparison to children and adults worldwide. So we use this graph to ask participants in the room questions about what are the factors that have caused both the level and trend um, in these values? And then on the other hand, what are the consequences of these levels and trends? And from that discussion, we began to fill out this causal loop diagram, this step one of representing the underlying system. So you can see uh, nodes related to the production of SSBs and the profits related to that production up here, and the nodes related to health, um, as well as government and civil society actions down here. I should say, in case uh, it wasn't clear, this um, double hash mark refers to a delay, so a relationship that we hypothesize is causal, but that happens over a longer time period than some of the other relationships. Um, so this kind of delay mark will become important later on. So here's kind of a, an action shot of the process. You can see that it was very deliberative and involved a lot of listening, conversation, um, interactive drawing. So it was quite an engaging, quite an exhaustive, uh, but I think also team building process. Um, and quite different from my experience and our experience of building a CLD based on the literature I uh, described previously. In step two, we started to integrate the intervention. So here we're actually considering multiple interventions within the same CLD uh, represented here in diamonds, the sugar sweetened beverage tax, and here a school sugar sweetened beverage ban. So we began to think through how these interventions primarily function and then how they're linked in with other parts of the existing system. So this is the most kind of detailed version of the causal loop diagram. We went away and then presented it to the same stakeholder group um, some months later to get their feedback and uh, refine this further. And then we really worked with them to try and identify if this is our baseline understanding, what are some of the things that we could evaluate using this as a springboard? So again, we went in two different directions with this, and I'll summarize both of them for you. Um, the first was to think about how we could use this to inform more of an impact evaluation. And we came up, this is still very much in flux, but in general, we plan to ask something such as, to what extent did SSC sales change following the introduction of both policies? And to what extent did SSC advertising intensity change over the same period? So this is related to the first question I shared with you, but somewhat different because now we're considering two interventions together 
And we're also considering not just the intended impact, the change in SSB sales, but also one of the unintended impacts that we can now anticipate looking at this diagram, the potential reaction from manufacturers um, in an effort to recapture potentially lost sales through increased advertising. Now we're kind of explicitly anticipating um, this feedback loop. This uh, map has also been useful in helping us to consider other unintended consequences uh, that might take place in other areas of the map, maybe related to school vendors or school profits, um, things that weren't necessarily on our radar before looking at this more comprehensively. So this is an example, uh, as we saw before, of using systems thinking in a CLB to inform a question that we might then go on to address using, again, an interrupted time series natural experimental evaluation method. But what might it look like to use a systems method? Uh, the stakeholder group actually encouraged us to go in this direction. So we found another archetype that seemed relevant here. This is the escalation archetype. Um, this is different from the one I showed you before. In the success to the successful archetype, we had two reinforcing feedback loops that were joined up. Here, we actually have two balancing loops. And again, you could imagine two actors kind of competing a bit and the actions of one are perceived as a threat to the other, who then takes a certain action, which is perceived as a threat. And so you can see how in this case, um, actions kind of escalate in both directions, although they're pulling in different and sort of opposite directions. So we thought there's something useful here, although we have to make some changes and modifications um, to build on this archetype and modify it to fit the scenario that we're discussing. But you can see here, Broadly, the idea of kind of profit maximizing vector versus uh, the delay here in the link between SSBs and health outcomes, um, but sort of the incentive to minimize the development of further NCDs. So leading to kind of opposite goals in, in this sense. But again, this delay I think is really important because it highlights uh, that these are happening on different timescales and that might become important later on. So we, uh, to summarize this process, are trying to use this detailed causal loop diagram as the basis for a more abstracted uh, CLB based on systems and archetypes, but modified to the context. And then using this as uh, the basis or foundation for the structure of a computer simulation system dynamics model. So, so far this has been built in Benson and it's still very much uh, being refined as we speak. But again, just to pull the curtain back a little bit, behind every variable or arrow in that Benson model, um, you can see that there's an equation and quite a detailed listing of um, either the parameters and numbers or assumptions or relationships underpinning um, the decisions and choices for those equations and those variables. And this is a really important part of the documentation around system dynamics modeling. Um, and then we're framing this as kind of a toy or sandbox system dynamics model in comparison to a much more detailed and comprehensive research model. Um, this is just to show you the kind of results that one might get from something like this. Uh, and for example, a insight one could derive from these graphs is even though government regulation might be increasing during a certain period, um, given the feedback loops and delays that are embedded in the structure of the system, we might not see a decline in SSBs right away. And in fact, it might take some time until that decline driven by regulation becomes apparent. So this can be kind of a useful way of um, forefronting conversations about expectations between different sectors and identifying why there might be resistance within a system to a policy um, or to a well-intentioned intervention. This is more on the communication side of system dynamics, but we intend to use the IC I Think simulator, um, which is the online simulator in which you can translate results from a system dynamics model into something that stakeholders can actually toggle and simulate on their own to input different assumptions or test different parameters or explore different scenarios. Um, so we have yet to kind of dig into this more, but I think it's an exciting way that we'll be able to 
both understand the model better ourselves, but also engage our stakeholder group and collectively deriving insights and ideas on the basis of this model. So again, I think this is still uh, not uncharted territory, but an area within population health research where a lot more work can be done and um, where we're still kind of in an explorative phase. Um, but I think it could be quite exciting to see um, what the value added of taking this approach might be, and also how it could feed back into conversations with stakeholders and the broader policy making process. One thing I can reflect on is that uh, within the group of stakeholders thus far, we've had people sort of spontaneously comment about how their thinking is um, starting to mirror some of the thinking in systems, language and mental models. Um, so I think maybe one of the quite powerful outcomes of this approach is the change both in our mindsets as the research team, but also in the stakeholder uh, mindset. Um, and so that's something we're sort of interested to explore further and that seems quite promising. I'll just conclude in my final minutes here by highlighting that uh, I think this is an area where there is a lot of innovation happening and a lot of these sort of frameworks and proposed processes being put forward. Um, for example, there's the Encompass framework that was published a couple of years ago. Um, Leandro Garcia put forward this action-oriented framework um, from 2021. And both of these frameworks, I think I would definitely point people towards. They do seem to involve um, intervention context in which the evaluation team has some role in co-envisioning or co-developing the program, and the program might be adapting to the evaluation as well. Um, we found ourselves in a slightly different position with both interventions where these were kind of large scale predetermined interventions in which we didn't um, impact their design or rollout. And so because of that, I think it was appropriate for us to consider a slightly different process for developing these evaluation research questions. Uh, we heard from Elizabeth McGill in the first session of these series, but I found this framework hugely helpful as well. And I would say it really parallels the process we describe here, where I think we kind of end up, uh, the process that I described today kind of concludes in steps one and two of, of phase two within this framework. So you can see some of the parallels um, there as well. Many thanks. This work has spanned a multitude of teams, um, both here in Barbados, the SSB and the evaluation team, as stakeholders on the WeGreen and WeConnect projects at the University of Exeter, the population health interventions team at the MRC epidemiology unit. Um, and through it all, I've really benefited from supervision from Jean Adams and Martin White, as well as mentorship from uh, folks at the System Dynamics Society. Um, thanks as well to my funders. And it would be wonderful to uh, conclude here and see if you have any questions or further further comments. Thank you. Okay, fantastic stuff, uh, Mary. I'm now I can see uh, applause coming in virtually already. So um, thank you for that uh, excellent session, uh, for that excellent talk. Um, so perhaps I can get things rolling with an uh, initial question. Then, of course, if anyone has any questions from the from the group, please, uh, either if you want to come off mute or write it in the chat, uh, your questions are very welcome. So an initial question for me, um, I, I think from the first uh, webinar we had uh, with Matt and Elizabeth, I think one of the points that was made is when thinking, using systems thinking approaches, we can get to the end. And one of the sort of comments that could be made is it's all just very complex and that being a wall in our sort of systems thinking. Um, but what I picked up from what you presented today is a lot of your outputs were very much a point from which your stakeholders could say, oh, that makes sense. That reflects what I'm thinking. Uh, and I imagine this may be something that you did when you started off with that initial sort of framework, the archetype, and then you went for the simpl simplification process. So I wonder if you can uh, expand a bit more in terms of what that process looks like that enables you to make sure that what your, out, your, out, what your outputs are, uh, are under understandable and useful. Sure, definitely. Um, yes, I think there's a part in the process where it can feel quite paralyzing. You know, you put in all this work to develop something very detailed, and then it's hard to know where to go from that. And I think that can be a major stumbling block for a lot of people engaging in this type of work. 
Um, I really found the systems archetypes to be a good way to unstick that blockage, even in cases where we ended up um, not necessarily using an established systems archetype, but developing a de novo one based on abstracting out from the detailed CLD. Um, I think using them gave our teams the permission to um, iterate back and forth from different levels of meaning making. Um, Connie or maybe some of the other um, kind of senior qualitative researchers could comment on this as well. But from my perspective, it's felt a bit like, uh, you know, the difference from going from detailed codes within qualitative analysis to broader themes and a higher level of, of meaning making. Um, and I think there might be something analogous here in terms of thinking about um, the patterns within feedback loops and being able to maybe uh, simplify them to convey a message about the power of, of a reinforcing or balancing feedback loop or a few combinations thereof. Add in some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, Connie. I was going to, I can't put it as eloquently <laughs> as Miriam, so I won't add to that, but I had actually a qualitative question for you. Um, so if, thanks for such a clear talk. It was um, yeah, really um, so well put together and coherently all these different ways one can think about it and apply it. And I was just um, wondering if you could say a little bit more about the sort of last pathway, the kind of um, you're setting a research question through systems thinking, and then also try to take a systems approach in evaluating um, you know, whatever might be happening, um, what is working, how it's working. Um, do you think a systems approach is sort of that simulation model is, um, you know, is then approaches again from the toolbox of system dynamics or other systems approaches, or do you think something like a, it's a very in-depth qualitative say, ethnographic way of kind of possibly thinking a bit more informally in systems could be a way of ticking that box, or is that essentially also part of our I guess maybe now a natural experimental evaluation toolkit and, and probably it's more the top right hand corner of evaluation. So yeah, I was just wondering how we can fill that um, top right, uh, bottom right corner with systems evaluation methods. Sure, yeah, I, I would just um, start by qualifying my comment uh, in that I think my thinking around this is still evolving and changing quite a bit and quite rapidly, but I can reflect on where I'm at with it now. Um, I think the first thing to say is that uh, as we're going forward with the system dynamics model as a systems method to address the sort of questions that emerge from the CLD, um, it is making us pause and reflect on, is this even still an evaluation or is this feeding into a different stage of the evaluation? My background is really on impact evaluations. That's what, what feels the most familiar to me. Um, whereas this is maybe, the system dynamics models may be feeding into the predictive phase of an evaluation. Um, Elizabeth McGill has a nice paper that sort of summarizes systems methods and stages of evaluation. Um, so that's a bit of what I've been thinking about. At the same time, a lot of the guidance around systems dynamics modeling is that they shouldn't necessarily be used for prediction, as in a specific prediction of a particular level in a particular year, but rather for increasing our understanding of um, how structure creates behavior. So I think there's something complex to untangle there. When it comes to qualitative methods, I am a big advocate of maybe using a case study method as an overall umbrella like approach, and then even maybe imagining a quantitative natural experimental evaluation method sort of um, subsumed within that. So as one component of a broader case study, but alongside and given equal importance to, to many other um, assessments of mechanism or process. Um, so in my experience, I've found process tracing to be a case study, a qualitative case study method that is quite um, comprehensive and useful, although I think there are a number of other methods that could be used there as well. Um, and I think in that sense, the causal loop diagram can represent quite a rich theory of change and can direct our attention to different types of data and different types of analyses and can almost in that sense provide a framework for integrating different types of data together and making meaning out of them. So a revised product of the overall evaluation could be an updated 
causal loop diagram that illustrates kind of which connections or feedback loops have been substantiated by the empirical um, evidence. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass to Janina. Yeah, your hand has been up for a while. Amazing. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, I'm always, I love hearing you, you know, give these talks because you explained it so beautifully and so coherently. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to ask you, parting from the all models are wrong, some of them are useful. We come into this kind of collision of two traditions, uh, where we were talking about prior in the computational science, mathematical, philosophical tradition and the grounded mathematical, like wicked, like complex problems, but we in the social sciences and behavior are dealing with wicked problems and how to marry up the social science and the wickedness of it with uh, computational models that can be contested from the mathematical tradition in order to land it into something that is achievable because you're working with stakeholders on the ground to actually make behavior changes policy that makes sense to them so how to marry up those two traditions yeah i think it's a, a big challenge and i'm not quite sure either but i can share some reflections so i think it does sort of a challenge our idea of what a model is for, what the model purpose is. And again, I think so many of the other types of models that we might be familiar with do prioritize or emphasize or strive for, you know, accurate predictions of the future. Um, so I think maybe we do need more clarity on, on how a system dynamics model or, or other systems modeling methods align or don't align with that. And actually, I think even within people who are, you know, method methodological experts, there is some controversy. So uh, <laughs> it's not going to be a simple or straightforward exercise. But I think engaging and understanding both sides of that controversy and how it applies in our kind of population health intervention setting is a useful conversation to have. Um, yeah, I also think that it comes back again to our key purpose. And I'll share this anecdote of um, a community-based system dynamics project and system dynamics model developed by, I think, Andrew Brown in Victoria, Australia. So this project was looking at um, sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and water consumption and worked with a group of stakeholders to try and identify the barriers and determinants and consequences of consuming sugary drinks. Um, but the stakeholder group included someone from the water authority. And they did develop, again, a toy model. So it was it was a conceptual model. It wasn't um, at the level of being a, you know, incredibly detailed, um, thoroughly validated model, but more of a thinking tool. But he reported um, that the use of this toy model was actually so useful in sort of shifting the mental models and the priorities of stakeholders, including the Water Authority representative, that that project contributed to the Water Authority committing to a large um, investment in improving the water infrastructure in that community as a consequence. So from a health perspective, I would say maybe, maybe the validity of that toy model isn't exactly so important, but the fact that it was one of the things that contributed to unsticking and to shifting that sort of understanding of how we might solve a problem, that is really profound and does seem like maybe what we are in the end after. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I wonder if there are any other questions or comments from the room. I'll just give a moment if anyone has anything they want to add in. If not, perhaps then we can bring this webinar to a close. Uh, I'll just say thanks again to Mariam for uh, joining us and uh, presenting so wonderfully uh, and uh, for, for this time of discussion as well that we've had. So this was uh, really great to have you. Um, I can say for our next uh, sort of webinar, we'll be building on what's been discussed today. Uh, so we'll be having a second se uh, session on causal loop diagrams. Uh, but one being more practical. So this will be a practical session with Leandro Garcia, uh, who will be uh, who will be uh, delivering a session on drawing causal loop diagrams. Uh, so yeah, throughout this session, there, there have been a few references to uh, points that we're hoping to have more webinars on. 
um, for example, one being uh, using leverage points. Um, so we're hoping to have uh, uh, James Nobles at some point this year on ripple effects mapping and leverage points using the act action scales model. Uh, and on systems dynamics, uh, we'll be announcing soon a session with Paris Gethi Seferadi, uh, who will be speaking on systems dynamics uh, from March, I believe, but the details for that will be sent out shortly. Uh, so um, I'll say thanks again to Miriam, and I hope you have a great day and uh, hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.